Hi, everyone. Um, as Emma mentioned, I do specialize in endometriosis with a special interest in thoracic endometriosis. And I hope that over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be able to explain what is thoracic endometriosis, how it presents treatments offered, and highlight some ongoing work and research projects that are aiming to improve care for women with thoracic endometriosis. I have nothing to disclose. Okay, so I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk some facts about thoracic endometriosis and what is it that we know about thoracic endometriosis so far. In the second part, I'm going to talk about challenges facing clinicians in the diagnosis and management of women with thoracic endometriosis and the effects this has on patients' journey. And then we'll finish off with highlighting some of the work we've done so far and future research work that, as, as I mentioned, and the main reason for this work is aiming to, prove, to improve care for women with thoracic endometriosis. So one in 10 women have endometriosis, and I'm sure you're all aware that endometriosis, it's a very challenging gynecological condition. It, it can affect anywhere in the body, and it is a very common disease that affects approximately 190 million women worldwide. Among these 190 million, million women worldwide with endometriosis, it's estimated that 12% have endometriosis outside the pelvis or outside the reproductive organs, which is known, we call it extra genital endometriosis. So endometriosis that's outside the reproductive organs is called extra genital endometriosis. So if we do some math, that means that approximately 20 million women worldwide will have extra genital endometriosis. So it's not, it's not a small number. And what is the most common site for extra genital endometriosis? It is in the chest or what we call in the thoracic cavity. So actually thoracic endometriosis is more common than what we think. So what is it that we know about thoracic endometriosis so far? First, it's definitely an underdiagnosed problem. And as I mentioned, it is more common than what we think. Um, this is an interesting paper that was uh, like it's an interesting finding from a recent paper that was published in 2019 that showed that cyclic pneumothorax, um, cyclic means that happens in, in a cyclic pattern, like every month with the periods usually. And pneumothorax means that when you have when you get a collapsed lung, which happens when air starts to leak uh, into the space between the lung and the chest wall. I'll explain this in more details in a second. But this paper interestingly has shown that thoracic endometriosis is responsible for approximately one third of all cases of pneumothorax in women of reproductive age. So again, I'm stressing on this fact, it's more common than what we think. Um, thoracic endometriosis has been reported to affect around 2% of women with deep or severe endometriosis. And women with thoracic endometriosis, they usually present at a later stage compared to women with pelvic endometriosis. So with endometriosis in the pelvis, often there are delays of like four to 10 years between first reporting the symptoms and confirming the diagnosis. So women with endometriosis in the pelvis, they, often, they usually present, they often present in the late twenties by the time they get to be seen by a gynecologist and get a diagnosis, they're usually in the late twenties. Sometimes obviously it might take longer than this, but usually they are in the late twenties. But a woman with thoracic endometriosis usually presents in the thirties with a peak age of incidence around 35 years old. And this difference between the age of presentation from being in the late 20s with the pelvic endometriosis to 35 years old with the thoracic endometriosis is usually explained that women with thoracic endometriosis are usually looked after by a &E doctors, chest doctors, GPs, and it usually takes some time for doctors to make the link between chest symptoms and endometriosis before being referred to a gynecologist. And that's why it just takes a little bit longer time usually. It has been shown that it's associated with pelvic endometriosis, mainly the deep form of endometriosis or the severe form of it in up to 80% of the cases. And it almost always affects the right side of the chest. It's something, it's like pathognomonic for disease. It's usually in, on the right side. Sometimes it does affect the, light, the left side. Sometimes it's bilateral, but it's more common. More than 90% of the cases usually affects the right side of the chest. So how can we classify thoracic endometriosis? The easiest classification is according to where the endometriosis is found in the chest, okay? 
so I'm just going to give a little bit of anatomy so that you can follow what I'm saying. So if we look here, this is the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is just a muscle partition that separates the abdomen from the chest cavity. And its main function is to help breathing, the breathing movement. There's something called the lung pleura. The pleura is this very, very thin line that covers the lung. And its main function is to protect the lung. And then we have here the trachea which is a tube that carries air to and from the lung. And then it branches here to give the bronchi and the bronchioles. And this is the lung itself, okay? So most commonly, thoracic endometriosis will affect the diaphragm and the lung pleura, which is the lung lining. And this is what we call diaphragmatic or pleural endometriosis. Less commonly, endometriosis might affect the trachea, bronchi, and the lung itself. And this is what we call tracheobronchial or lung endometriosis. So there are two types, either diaphragmatic or pleural endometriosis. And the second type is the, the less common type is the tracheobronchial or the lung endometriosis. So first, let's talk about diaphragmatic and pleural endometriosis. As I said, this is the most common type. So ladies with diaphragmatic or pleural disease will usually present first with cyclic. As I said, cyclic, it just happens with, with the period every month with cyclic shoulder tip pain, pain in the shoulder, chest pain, and shortness of breath. But as the disease progresses and start to cause like some holes in the diaphragm or holes in the pleura of the lung, the air from inside the abdomen will escape to the chest and that will cause something called cyclic pneumothorax. And I said, pneumothorax is just when you have this air inside the, the pleura of the lung, which causes collapsed lung. So this cyclic pneumothorax usually happens a day before to three days after the start of a period. And sometimes they develop something called hemothorax, which is a little bit of blood inside the lining of the lung. The problem with thoracic endometriosis or diaphragmatic or pleural disease, you have to have a very high index of suspicion to be able to diagnose it. Because usually when the disease progresses, as I said, when it starts, you would have some cyclic symptoms that happens with the period. But when the disease progresses and then you start to have some holes in the diaphragm and holes in the pleura, and as the holes get bigger, the cyclic pattern of the problem can sometimes disappear to make it much harder for us to diagnose it. The way to investigate diaphragmatic and pleural endometriosis is usually MRI. MRI, it has been shown. So that we have two types of scans, either an MRI scan or a CT scan. The MRI has been shown to have a better sensitivity to diagnose diaphragmatic and pleural disease. But obviously the gold standard with endometriosis, like I'm sure you're aware, the gold standard to diagnose pelvic endometriosis is to have a laparoscopy, which is a keyhole surgery, look inside the abdomen and see the endometriosis. It's the same here. The gold standard to diagnose diaphragmatic and pleural endometriosis is a keyhole, keyhole surgery, either with a laparoscopy, which is a keyhole surgery looking inside the abdomen, or with a thoracoscopy, which is a, with a, which is a keyhole surgery that looks inside the chest and the lung. And the most important part that you'd have a look at it, take a sample to confirm the diagnosis that it's endometriosis. But obviously it allows you that sometimes you can treat it at the same time. So if you want like a less invasive way to diagnose diaphragmatic and pleural disease, it's the MRI scan. It has a high sensitivity, but it's not 100% accurate. But the gold standard is to have a visualization, direct look, either through the abdomen or through the chest. Uh, how to treat diaphragmatic and pleural endometriosis management? It depends on the presentation. So usually, as I said, because it presents with some holes in the pleura and the diaphragm, and usually this causes lung collapse. So if ladies are presenting to A&E with acute chest pain because of a pneumothorax or like the air in the lung pleura, then the emergency management is to put a tube in the chest to drain this air out of the lung. And this is just as an emergency treatment. But if you want to treat the underlying condition, the long-term management of thoracic endometriosis is similar to pelvic endometriosis. As I'm sure you're all aware, endometriosis is an estrogen dependent condition. So endometriosis in the chest is similar. It is still estrogen dependent. So we can try and suppress the disease with some sort of hormonal treatment like the contraceptive pills or the progesterone only pills. And sometimes we can give the like the GNHRH analogs, which are the injections that can cause temporary, temporary menopause. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, like the Zolodex injections or Prostat. 
or we can do surgery if we tried the hormonal treatment and it didn't work, or if there are holes in the diaphragm or pleura that needs fixing. And surgery would be surgery to excise the endometriosis if it's affecting the diaphragm. We excise the endometriosis from the diaphragm and suture the diaphragm afterwards. And this is usually a surgery which is performed as a joint case between the endometriosis surgeons and the bowel surgeons. Or if the endometriosis is affecting the, the pleura, which is the lining of the lung, this surgery is usually performed by the thoracic surgeons and usually involves removal, removal of the pleura with the endometriosis. But the, the thing with thoracic endometriosis, they, unfortunately, there is a, it's a straight with a very high recurrence rate, so the symptoms usually come back. Uh, we're currently working on writing up a paper that looked into like the recurrence rates after different forms of treatment for women with thoracic endometriosis. And we found that the treatment that is associated with the lowest recurrence rates is surgery. When you do surgery to remove the endometriosis, to excise it, followed by hormonal treatment for six months. And usually this hormonal treatment is in the form of GnHRH and it was, it, it was, was a straight to be as was found to be associated with the lowest recurrence rate. But I have to say the findings from our study has to be interpreted with like extreme caution because the numbers included in the study were very, very small. Okay, so if you go to the other type of thoracic endometriosis, which I said is the less common type, which is the tracheobronchial and lung endometriosis. It's when you have like endometriosis deposits in the trachea, bronchi, or in the lung itself. And that usually presents with cyclic, as I said, something with the period, or even when the disease is more advanced, non-cyclic chest pain, or sometimes when you have the disease in the bronchi here, the endometriosis deposit, some ladies might start coughing blood, which is one, uh, which is one of the signs of thoracic endometriosis if it's happening in a cyclic fashion. Again, it needs even a higher index of suspicion because this cyclic pattern doesn't, is not always present. It's, it's much easier if the symptoms happens every time a lady have her period. But when the, as I said, when the disease progresses and it happens at any time, it's not very easy to make the link between these thoracic symptoms and endometriosis. But I have to mention here that because this is not a very common type of presentation when the endometriosis affects the trachea, bronchi, and the lung, it's very important to exclude other more serious causes for coughing of blood than endometriosis, because as I mentioned, this is not a very common presentation with it. The diaphragmatic and pleural endometriosis is more common. Uh, to diagnose it, CT scan is better sensitivity for the trachea and the bronchi and the lung parenchyma. So this is different to the diaphragmatic and pleural disease, which I just mentioned. MRI is better for the diaphragmatic and pleural disease. But if you want to look into trachea, bronchi, and lung problems, then the CT scan is usually better. But again, the gold standard is to actually look at it and see if they have endometriosis or not. And that's usually would be with a thoracoscopy, which is a keyhole surgery, looking into the chest, taking a sample from the area that is suspected to be endometriosis. And as I mentioned, when you do the, the laparoscopy or the thoracoscopy, you have the chance to treat at the same time. Management is the same, hormonal treatment or surgery, but with tracheobronchial and lung endometriosis, hormonal treatment is usually the best here. If, if it manages to control the symptoms, it's usually the best because the surgery is much more ex extensive than the surgery that you might have for diaphragmatic endometriosis. And the surgery is either going to be like a keyhole surgery in the chest or an open ch chest surgery, like an open cut in the chest. And the surgery depends on the extent or the site of the endometriosis deposits. And it, this surgery is usually performed by the thoracic surgeons and remove, like if, if the endometriosis deposits like affects this area of the lung, then it, remove, it involves like removal of the affected area of the lung with the endometriosis deposit. But as I mentioned, this more extensive surgery and sometimes, and it's often done with an open surgery. So it's best um, if we can manage it with hormonal treatment. But again, the problem with hormonal treatment is that it has very high recurrence rate. So what are the challenges with thoracic endometriosis? First is the lack of awareness of the condition among clinicians. So women with thoracic endometriosis usually would present to chest doctors, A&E doctors, GPs, and treatment is usually directed to treat the chest symptoms that, you, that they have, the pneumothorax, for example, or the lung collapse, 
rather than actually treating the underlying cause of this lung collapse. And this leads to frequent admissions to any delays in the diagnosis, et cetera. And that's why it takes them a longer time to diagnose a lady with thoracic endometriosis compared to pelvic endometriosis. Also, thoracic endometriosis has different clinical presentations. I just explained that this cyclic pattern, that, this, that the symptoms of thoracic endometriosis that happens with every period, makes it a bit easier to diagnose it. But when this cyclic pattern disappears, it's not always present, especially in the more advanced disease. So sometimes it's even more difficult for clinicians to make the link between chest symptoms and endometriosis. And as I said, because usually patients with thoracic endometriosis will be seen by GPs, a and &E, uh, &E doctors, and chest doctors. They're not completely aware of the endometriosis and how it can cause like thoracic endometriosis, et cetera. Also, there isn't a one single test that can diagnose thoracic endometriosis, and that makes it more challenging. As I mentioned, CT is the best if you're thinking about um, lung and tracheobronchial disease. MRI is the best if you're thinking about the diaphragm or the lung pleura. If you do a keyhole surgery to look into the chest, you can sometimes miss something on the diaphragm because you're looking from the top and the diaphragm is usually affected from the abdominal side. If you do a keyhole surgery from the abdomen, you can only see the abdominal side of the diaphragm, but it can miss some disease in the lung itself. So the one size fits all approach is not really possible with thoracic endometriosis, which makes it like really challenging. And finally, unfortunately, we don't have any national or international guidelines or recommendations on how is it best to diagnose and treat women with thoracic endometriosis. Doctors, we love guidelines and, and recommendations on how to manage and diagnose patients. But to be able to develop recommendations for management of any disease, these recommendations should be based on good, high quality research. And unfortunately, so far, with thoracic endometriosis, we have very, very limited research. So there are a lot of challenges um, and lots of un un unanswered questions with thoracic endometriosis. So how can we move forward to try and provide better care for women with thoracic endometriosis? As I mentioned, it has to start with good quality research. We've done some work and the work we've done has started with a call for help from 20 patients with thoracic endometriosis. These 20 women with thoracic endometriosis sent a letter to the BSG. BSG is the British Society of Gynae Endoscopy. They sent a letter highlighting the delays in diagnosis, the conflicting advice, and the lack of guidance they received in the UK endometriosis treatment centers. And I quote from the letter that the current treatment on offer, for, this is the patient's letter, the current treatment on offer for thoracic endometriosis is insufficient and does not meet the BSGE standards that require the endometriosis to be excised wherever possible. The treatment varies considerably between different centers. It is usually then for been a battle to even get to a diagnosis. At some BSG centers, patients have then been told that surgical treatment is not possible for diaphragmatic endometriosis at all, and that their only option is systemic hormonal treatment. Also, I'm still quoting from the letter. Patients at other BSG centers have been offered surgical ablation, followed by hormones. But in, in our experience, ablation is certainly ineffective at treating full thickness diaphragmatic disease. This is very true. When you do ablation, it's that you burn the tip of endometriosis that you see. So it's like the tip of the iceberg. You only burn the bit that you see. But to be able to actually treat it, you have to excise the whole disease. Because usually, as I mentioned, it's like the tip of the iceberg, the most of the disease you can't actually see it, it's just underneath the diaphragm. We believe that at least one BSG center in the UK should accept national referrals and should be offering routine collaboration between endometriosis specialists, gynecologists, um, bowel surgeons, and cardiothoracic surgeons to treat diaphragmatic disease. As I mentioned now, there's a difference between diaphragmatic disease, pleural disease, tracheal and bronchial disease. It's like a big entity, and that's why they call it thoracic endometriosis syndrome, because it involves lots of many entities in it. So thoracic endometriosis, it is very topical now, and um, um, all-party parliamentary group um, in their 2020 endometriosis inquiry 
uh, report has concluded that there are no NHS care pathways for endometriosis outside the pelvic cavity. Do you remember when I mentioned about the extra genital endometriosis that affect 12% of women with endometriosis and like around 20 million worldwide? Unfortunately, we don't have any care pathways for this group of women, despite it affecting up to 10% of those with endometriosis. The old party parliamentary group is calling for NICE, which is then to ensure that care pathways for those with endometriosis outside the pelvic cavity are developed and implemented, starting with thoracic endometriosis. So it's very topical now, and everyone is trying to look into things on how to improve care for women with thoracic endometriosis. So we started by developing an international working group from England, Scotland, France, United States, working very closely with the BSG, which, as I mentioned, the British Society of Gynae Endoscopy and the World Endometriosis Society, to try and come up with some research projects aiming to improve care for women with thoracic endometriosis nationally and internationally. We started this work with a national survey of current practice. So we wanted to find out what is the doctors in the UK do, like the in the endometriosis center. So we started with some, an, a national survey and we found that 30% of uh, endometriosis surgeons have never managed a patient with thoracic endometriosis. And this is nothing wrong with these um, 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 surgeons. It's just, we don't see it very often. And as I said, because mainly they are being treated and managed um, outside um, the gynecology service. They're usually managed by GPs, a and &Es, um, a &E doctors and um, chest doctors. So 30% have never managed a patient with thoracic endometriosis, and only 9% manage more than 30 cases. Only 4% of clinicians always ask about chest symptoms about thoracic endometriosis, and only 31% would only screen for the fragment. So when we do the keyhole surgery to look into the abdomen to look for endometriosis, like the pelvic endometriosis, Usually, we try and look at the diaphragm at the same time to see if they have endometriosis or not. But unfortunately, only 30% would routinely screen for diaphragmatic endometriosis. And then more than half of the respondent, respondents believe that care should be centralized either regionally or nationally. And this is in line with what the patients with thoracic endometriosis have suggested, that there should be regional or national centers that can develop expert opinion to this group with thoracic endometriosis. So we're currently working on two streams. The first is an international working group working on developing, the international working group that I've just mentioned, working on developing an international guideline on how to diagnose and manage women with thoracic endometriosis. As I said, doctors need guideline and recommendations for management. And we're currently working with this international group to try and develop guidelines. And hopefully these guidelines should feed into the NICE endometriosis guideline for us to have national and international recommendations on how it's best to diagnose and manage women with thoracic endometriosis. And obviously with any rare disease, it's best to have women refer to two or three centers across the country who has the most expertise in treating this rare condition. So the second working stream is that we've developed a BSG working party. And as I mentioned, the BSG is the society, is our, is our endometriosis society. So it's a BSG working party working on a national service development project. And the aim of this project is to move towards centralized care for women with thoracic endometriosis. And we're hoping that hopefully by 2022, that we'll have two or three centers in the country who can look after women with thoracic endometriosis. Also, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to provide better care, we need high quality research. That's everything in medicine. To be able to offer you the best treatment available, we need to have proper research to tell us which is the best treatment that we can offer. And to do so, we need high numbers of women with thoracic endometriosis. We need all endometriosis doctors to be routinely asking women with endometriosis about chest symptoms, like we ask routinely about bowel or bladder symptoms when we see them in clinic. So we're currently looking into adding the symptoms of thoracic endometriosis, like the chest pain, shoulder tip pain, shortness of breath, et cetera, recurrent um, collapsed lungs. Into the net, we're looking into adding these symptoms into the national questionnaires that patients with endometriosis fill in when they get to be seen in an endometriosis center. I'm sure some of you will be aware of this. 
And also we need a database that shows us what happens to women that we treat with thoracic endometriosis. What happens to patients who receive surgery for thoracic endometriosis or patients who receive hormonal treatment? Do they get better with surgery or hormonal treatment? And how long do they get better for? When do the symptoms come back? And that's why we're looking into reporting the thoracic endometriosis surgery cases to our national database. This would mean that in two years time, we would have the largest worldwide database of thoracic endometriosis, which will enable us to generate like high quality research and subsequently be able to provide or improve care for women with thoracic endometriosis. And that's it from me for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such an interesting and informative talk. It was great. So much information. And so I'm going to... It might be a lot to take in. Huh? Sorry? I'm sorry. It might be a lot to take in, but I'm very happy to answer all the questions that you, you ask. Or if there's anything, anything that wasn't very clear during the presentation, we can just go through it together. Oh, great. And it will be... Um, it's recorded, so it can be replayed over and over again um, just to take it in better. Um, so... The first question is, is acid reflux a, a symptom of thoracic endometriosis? Uh, so it's, well, it, the, the, the straightforward answer is no. Acid reflux is usually a symptom of a stomach problem. So if we look into uh, our body, like when we eat, um, the food goes into like a tube called the esophagus, and this tube feeds into the stomach. So the symptoms of acid reflux are usually secondary to a stomach or an esophagus problem. So if we just talk about acid reflux per se, then no, acid reflux is not a symptom of thoracic endometriosis. However, some people mistake chest pain for acid reflux. And if that's the case, and these symptoms are happening in a cyclic pattern, then maybe there's a way to like explore this further. But if we just take an acid reflux symptoms is it a symptom of thoracic endometriosis it's no because acid reflux symptoms are usually secondary to a stomach or an esophagus problem which is the tube that takes food from your mouth to the stomach it's different to chest symptoms if that makes sense okay um the next question is is chest pain between periods a symptom of thoracic yeah. endometriosis 100 percent. i think i mentioned this in the talk definitely chest pain during the time of the period is one of the hallmarks of the disease and if this is a recurrent symptom then i think you should speak to the gyne your gp or gynecologist and ask to be seen in an endometriosis center to explore this further especially if you have a symptom especially if you are known to have um, endometriosis especially deep endometriosis okay thank you um I think you've, you've kind of, you've spoken about this as well. So is it common and possible for thoracic endometriosis to be misdiagnosed as pleurisy? I hope, hope I said it right. Um, yeah, pleurisy, yes. So uh, pleurisy is a sign of chest pain. So yes, like the, when, when you have a lung collapse or because of some air in the space between the chest and the lung, or when you have... Um, uh, chest pain, this can present as pleurisy. So if these symptoms are cyclic symptoms that happen with the period, or if these symptoms started as cyclic period that happens every month, and then they lost the cyclic pattern, but they're still persistent in a patient with, with deep endometriosis, then yes, this can be a sign of thoracic endometriosis. Um, I just want to say some thoracic endometriosis can happen in isolation. Yeah? It can happen on its own without having like pelvic endometriosis, but this is very, very, very uncommon to happen. People seem to think that thoracic endometriosis is a progression from pelvic endometriosis. And that's why it's usually associated with them in like approximately 80% of the cases. Um, so yeah, pleurisy in a patient with pelvic endometriosis, especially if this pleurisy is a cyclic pattern, that can be a sign of thoracic endometriosis. It might be, we, we might do the investigations and don't find thoracic endometriosis and possibly she would have to explore other options with her GP or the, or the chest surgeon, but it can be a sign. Okay. Um, and how would you recommend um, going about getting a diagnosis of thoracic endometriosis if you expect that you, if you suspect that you have it? So uh, as I mentioned, it's, um, the, the, 
there are no guidelines on how to diagnose and manage thoracic anemia. So, so for now, we are just trying to develop, like, for example, at Southmead Hospital where we work, we're trying to develop like our own local guideline based on the evidence that we can find so far, but it's not very high quality evidence. But for us, for example, if we, we are an endometriosis center, so if we see someone with symptoms that are suggestive of thoracic endometriosis, then we, the first thing is that we book them for an MRI scan to look into the chest. And if the MRI scan has shown that um, this patient has thoracic endometriosis, then we treat accordingly, either offer hormonal treatment or offer surgery according to, they've probably been on hormonal treatment for quite some time and they want some surgery and we can discuss like the surgery, whether it's gonna be like a joint case with the thoracic surgeons or a joint case with the bowel surgeon. But what I'm trying to say, MRI is usually our first line um, investigation. If it shows thoracic endometriosis, then they get treated as patients with thoracic endometriosis, either with hormonal treatment or surgery. If the MRI did not show thoracic endometriosis and we and the symptoms are suggestive of a lung or tracheal bronchial endometriosis, then we would request a CT scan for them to exclude that they have anything in the lung or the trachea. Still, if this comes back as negative and they have persistent symptoms of like recurrent chest pain or recurrent pneumothorax, then we do a keyhole surgery have a look inside the tummy to see if they have any diaphragmatic endometriosis or not. It's like with pelvic endometriosis, because with pelvic endometriosis, when you suspect it, sometimes you do some tests like the MRI or, or an ultrasound scan. But if these tests are negative and the symptoms are persistent, we would usually offer um, like a keyhole surgery to confirm the findings. So it's the same. We do the MRI or the CT scan. If they're positive, then that's easy solved. We know they've got thrust endometriosis. If that's negative, then we can discuss either starting them on empirical hormonal treatment to see if it helps, or we can just book them for um, a thoracoscopy, which is a keyhole surgery in the chest, or a laparoscopy to look at the diaphragm. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the next question is, so could re reoccurrent collapsed lungs as a teenager be caused by thoracic endometriosis when no cause was even found by a bronchos bronchoscopy? Um, and if this occurred before periods had started? Oh God, um, just say this again, Emma, please. I, I oh, missed. sorry. Um, okay. Could re reoccurrent collapsed lungs as a teenager yeah. um, be caused by thoracic endometriosis when no cause was found even by a bronchoscopy? And if this occurred before periods had started? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so the first part of the question, is recurrent pneumothorax a sign of thoracic endometriosis even if the bron bronchoscopy is negative? That is possible because, um, let me just draw you some, like something very quickly. So, and, uh, excuse my drawing, it's not the very, the best. Can you see this here? Can't faintly, but... Um... Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So if uh, bronchoscopy means that they put like a, um, like a camera that looks into the bronchi and like into this area of the chest, okay? So sometimes if the endometriosis is affecting the diaphragm in this area, which is from the abdominal side, then you would need a laparoscopy like into the abdomen to have a look here. Like the bronchoscopy, we're not going to be able to see the disease okay. of the diaphragm from the abdominal side of the diaphragm, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the first question is yes. If you have recurrent pneumothorax, that happens usually around the time of the period, it can be related to thoracic endometriosis, even with a negative bronchoscopy. However, it's very, very, very unlikely for someone to develop chest symptoms that are secondary to thoracic endometriosis before starting the periods, it's very, very, very unlikely. So with this, I would be more inclined to explore other causes of pneumothorax that are not endometriosis and will leave endometriosis as the last option because usually the symptoms of endometriosis will start when the estrogen kicks in uh, to stimulate the endometrial tissue to work. And before the, the, the monarch or before starting the periods, there's not much estrogen around. So it's, it's very unlikely. Okay, thank you. Um, I think you kind of covered treatment, but um, this the next question is, 
which medication could help with um, pain around the chest and ribs if the codomal doesn't seem to help with thoracic endometriosis. So if we're talking like painkillers, it's unfortunately they are the same, like either like the paracetamol, ibuprofen, naproxen sometimes is better if they don't have any problems with like allergies to ibuprofen or non steroidals Naproxen is usually better than ibuprofen to help with the pain. Um, Cocodamol helps sometimes, but often gives like um, constipation symptoms and some people like find that they are a bit drowsy afterwards. Um, um, sometimes the hormonal treatment, as I mentioned, it helps controlling the disease and controlling the symptoms, either the combined pills or the progesterone pills, or even more like extensive form of treatment like the injections. Or sometimes if just the, the main symptom is just this shoulder tip pain that comes from like a, a nerve irritation um, when the endometriosis is very close to the diaphragm, sometimes we can give them like some, some medicines like amitriptyline or something that try and help um, reduce the pain that comes from the nerves, like amitriptyline and gamapentin, um, which is like other like, um, like neuromodulators to help with the pain. Okay, great. And the next question is, recently diagnosed with thoracic endometriosis, someone's wondering if you think having a hysterectomy would help. Uh, no. <laughs> so it, it depends on the symptoms. So uh, hysterectomy is not the answer for endometriosis. And this is a big, big myth for um, women with endometriosis. They, they think that the endometriosis... So we have different types, okay? So we have endometriosis, which is the disease that affects um, the pelvis. And we have something called adenomyosis, which is the endometriosis that affects the muscles of the uterus, Okay. So if someone has like severe endometriosis in the pelvis, just performing a hysterectomy will not take away the pain because of the endometriosis in the pelvis, because we haven't treated it. A hysterectomy will just stop them from having their periods and will stop them from having period cramps that comes with the period and the pain that sometimes comes before having a period. That's all what hysterectomy is going to do. Endometriosis is not going to take away the pain that's associated with endometriosis. If you're having problems opening your bowels, having problems passing urine because of bladder endometriosis, or like the everyday pain that you have because of endometriosis, these are not going to go away with a hysterectomy. Hysterectomy would only take away the pain that happens during the period or around the time of the period. And as I said, lots of endometriosis patients would have like pain during sexual intercourse or after sexual intercourse this will not going to go away with hysterectomy. Hysterectomy will solve heavy period problems, period cramps problem, and the pain that starts just before the period. It's not going to solve any other problems with endometriosis. Some people would say that doing an ophorectomy, which is, means removal of the ovaries, to suppress, like to stop the ovaries from producing estrogen, can help with the recurrence of the endometriosis disease. But the problem is, Endometriosis is usually a disease of young patients. And once you take the ovaries away, you would have to give them some HRT form to try and like give them the hormones that they are missing after we've taken the ovaries out. And some people say that the estrogen and the HRT can like promote the cells of the endometriosis to like start working again. So to answer the question, hysterectomy per se cannot help pelvic endometriosis symptoms and definitely cannot help thoracic endometriosis symptoms. If you have a nodule or a deposit of endometriosis, this deposit has to be removed or treated with hormonal treatment to suppress it from causing pain. But hysterectomy is not part of this. Hysterectomy will solve heavy period problems and pain, period cramps that happens with the period. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, so after... So you mentioned after doing um, a two-year um, research, um, two years of research of thoracic endometriosis, um, would there be a pathway um, developed with NICE um, for thoracic endometriosis? Yes, hopefully. So as I said, the best way to, do, to develop guideline is that when you have lots of research um, on a subject, and then you can look into this research and try and develop some recommendations based on this high quality research, okay? That's the best way to develop a guideline. 
Unfortunately, with thoracic endometriosis, we don't have any high quality research. It's all about something called case reports that I saw a patient with thoracic endometriosis and I write a, a, a paper about this single patient that I saw. So you don't have high, big numbers. You don't have high numbers or anything. So now the other way of developing a guideline is that you sit with a group of experts experts in the field of endometriosis and experts in the field of thoracic endometriosis and you, you all sit together in one room and try and develop a guideline based on best practice or or or, or based on what these experts think is the best way forward it's not a very high quality evidence but it can be a start but this is the start this is what the expert panel has decided the way it should be going forward and then if we start collecting the data from now after two years we'd have a higher like database where we can generate proper quality research and then revise these guidelines afterwards thank you um so this question also relies on um, a lot of research but i was just wondering in your experience so do you know have you seen a pattern in the recovery time um of thoracic endometriosis so they always come back. That's the problem. Um, uh, the problem is the recurrence rate, as I said, is very, very high with thoracic endometriosis. And we don't know if the reason for this, again, because there isn't any proper research to follow the patients up with thoracic endometriosis. We don't know if this is the reason because when they did the surgery in the first place, they just uh, burned the endometriosis, like dithermid it. They didn't excise it. Or if they excise it, that they need to put like something called like a mesh uh, to stop the holes from developing in the diaphragm. Or if they just treated them, the, the endometriosis from the diaphragmatic side and they missed another bit that was just higher up in the lung that has to be done by the thoracic surgeons. So there are lots of factors that cause the recurrence of the disease to be very high. But the small work that we've done, which I mentioned in the talk, is that when we looked into this, we found to decrease the chance of recurrence, the best way is to remove, is to do a surgery to excise the endometriosis and then give the injections like the Zoladex injections or the prostate injections that, in, um, that cause the temporary menopause. Um, if we give this for six months, this was associated with the lowest recurrence rate. But again, as it is with pelvic endometriosis, uh, there are no guarantees with the surgery. Sometimes you do very big pelvic endometriosis surgery and you think you've removed all of the endometriosis but sometimes the nerves that has been affected by the endometriosis disease even after the surgery sometimes they might cause still like ongoing pain problems and that's why I would usually the next step would be referred to pain management clinic to try and give some medicines or other alternatives to try and cope with the pain in a way the, even the pelvic endometriosis surgery is not 100% effective it gives you a 70% improvement in your pain symptoms um, it's never 100% if that makes sense I'm not sure if, the, if I answered that question like if I, not, if I haven't answered it you can ask it again I think I completely, I'm completely a bit lost with <laughs> um, 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 answering it in a way did well, that answer I, it right? I feel like you've covered it but if you want to go, if you want to go over the key points, if you're if you're unsure yourself, um, feel free. Uh, no, no, I'm fine. If you, if you think I'm, I've answered the question, yeah, it's fine. Then. Um, so if this condition affects the lungs, does it make sufferers more high risk when it comes to COVID? Uh, a good question, and the honest answer is I don't know. Um, no one uh, has looked into this, so I don't want to be like sitting here and talking stuff that. Um, this is an unanswered question. No one has looked into it. Um, and the honest answer is, I don't know, to be honest. Okay. And um, how long approximately um, from diagnosis does it take, does it normally take for endometriosis to build up enough to cause the lungs to collapse? Okay. So um, again, it's, it's the theme here. We don't know everything about thoracic endometriosis, but what we know so far is that women with endometriosis usually develop their symptoms in the like mid twenties. They usually present to, end, to the endometriosis service between twenty five to thirty years. This is usually about the time when they. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later, but that's usually the average time is between twenty five to thirty years. And people have found because they think that the thoracic endometriosis is a progression 
from um, the pelvic endometriosis. So they think it takes around five to seven years for women with deep endometriosis to start to develop chest symptoms, if that makes sense. And that's why it usually starts to develop at around 35 years. So the average is between five to seven years from starting the symptoms of endometriosis to um, the pelvic endometriosis to starting to develop chest symptoms between five to seven years difference. Okay, fantastic. Um, and a couple of people actually have asked, can we um, refer ourselves for research or do we have to do it through doctors? Um, so obviously your GP, well, it's a good question. So we are, it, it's going to be like a national research thing. So every, any patient who's going to be referred to um, an endometriosis clinic, we're, we're still working on this now, but we are going, as I said, we are going to be including all the, all the questions. It's anonymous, like we're, no patient's names are going to be mentioned anyway, but it's going to be an anonymous questionnaire that we ask every patient with endometriosis some chest symptoms. And then if we find some chest during surgery or if we do surgery for them, then we include it in the national database, which we do for any patient with severe endometriosis, but we're trying to add this to the thoracic endometriosis patients. Again, it's all anonymous. No patient details are going to be mentioned anyway, but it's just the important for us is just to see if we do surgery and they come for follow-up, have the symptoms improved? How long does it take for the symptoms to come back, et cetera? Um, and once we start like proper research, this is going to be like, we're going to advertise for it, like on Twitters, like on social media, and patients are very welcome definitely to get um, um, to be involved in, in this research. Um, the international work that we're doing, um, there's going to be lots of patients' representatives, and mainly we're going to be approaching the patients who have sent the, the letter to the BSG to start with to be involved in this research, um, because it's usually the patient's voice is very different to the clinician's voice. Often what we need as clinicians is very different from one patient's needs. So there's going to always be a patient's voice on the panel of, of like developing the guideline or developing the research ideas and like the research proposals. Um, and once we... Once this is in place, um, patients from na nationally would be um, invited to participate in the research if they want to, yeah. Thank you. And could thoracic endometriosis be misdiagnosed as, oh boy, this is a very complicated word for me, so uh, costochondritis? Yeah. yeah. The costochondritis means when you have just an inflammation in the like the, the bones of the chest, like just to make it simple to everyone, it's just inflammation in the bones of the chest, which gives you this chest pain. Um, again, it's very, uh, we, I don't want to be scaring everyone, but if you go like any pain in your chest, this is because you've got thoracic endometriosis. Again, it is, when we did our research, we found that approximately 500 women in the UK would have problems with thoracic endometriosis per year, okay, around 500. Um, so it's not as uncommon as we think, but it is still considered a rare, a rare disease, okay? Any disease that affects around 500 patients per year is still considered within the rare category, okay? So costochondritis is very common and it does not happen because of thoracic endometriosis. Yes, costochondritis can give you chest pain and the chest pain, if it has a cyclic pattern, or in a patient with deep endometriosis, the symptoms started as cyclic and then it started to like have a non-cyclic pattern and be present at the same time. It's not unreasonable to try and explore it, but let's put like um, common, like common things are common. Costochondritis is very common and it's not usually a sign of thoracic endometriosis. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and someone with thoracic endometriosis would like to know why does um, the right shoulder hurt? Is this connected? Is there a nerve involved? So it's a very, so this is a $1 million question, okay? No one knows how, uh, we, we don't even know how endometriosis self de develops. We have lots of theories that haven't been proven 100% yet on how endometriosis in itself presents. And then how pelvic endometriosis spreads to being thoracic endometriosis. Because, you know, endometriosis can affect anywhere in the body. It can affect the brain, it can affect the nose. Some people will present like cy cyclic nosebleeds. It can affect uh, the brain and cause some bleeds in the brain. So obviously, this is very, very rare. But I mean, 
we don't know how endometriosis spreads from the pelvis to um, the chest, but people seem to think that the endometriosis cells, when they are present in the pelvis, there's a pathway that they can follow mainly on the right side. The pathway on the left side is blocked. So they may need the easy way for these cells to follow, just to make it simple to everyone. And the pathway that these cells can follow mainly takes them to the right side of the, of the diaphragm. And then once the diaphragm gets irritated, there's a nerve called the phrenic nerve, which is, um, supplies the diaphragm and makes it work. Once this phrenic nerve gets affected or get in touch with some endometriosis cells, it starts to radiate shoulder tip pain um, to the chest, um, uh, like shoulder tip pain. And this is mainly from the irritation of the diaphragm. And sometimes it irritates and gives pain at the back of the neck uh, between the two. We've got like bones here called the scapulas. So between the two scapulas, sometimes you can develop this. And this is referred to pain from the phrenic nerve that is supplying the diaphragm if you have some endometriosis close to that nerve. Okay, thank you. Um, someone would like to know if um, it can be misdiagnosed or confused as asthma. Uh, no, asthma is, is very, asthma is very, very um, different. Asthma is, is, uh, it's not cyclic usually, it doesn't happen, it doesn't often have a cyclic pattern. Um, asthma is usually relieved by inhalers, and this is not going to be the case with thoracic endometriosis. If you have asthma and take some inhalers and it makes your symptoms better, then this is asthma. And as I said, the main idea of this talk is to raise awareness about thoracic endometriosis, but it's not the answer for all chest question in ladies. The more common things are common. Thoracic endometriosis, yes, it's more common than what we think, but it's not the answer for all chest symptoms in ladies. And it's very important to exclude the normal or the most common causes first. Asthma is asthma. Costochondritis is costochondritis. But if we think that the symptoms are unexplained in a patient with endometriosis, especially if the symptoms are cyclic, it happens with the period, then it's definitely worth exploring.